Hello, my name is Shahyar Shahyari, and this is the first lecture of a series of lectures on linear algebra based on my book, Retrolinear. Um, this is the first lecture where I briefly tell you, give you some idea of what linear algebra is about. And I will start doing that by sharing three problems. So um, the first problem is about Chloe. Chloe has uh, uh, been thinking about herself quite a bit and has been recording a lot of data. And she has decided that her state of mind is always one of the following four states. She either is thinking about something interesting or engaged with some exciting external task, or these were positive states. Um, she's uh, being critical of herself and internal negative states, sort of. Um, and, um, or she's on autopilot, um, either thinking about or interacting with mundane or boring stuff. And she's also uh, kept track of um, how she moves from one state to another. And she has figured out that if she, for example, if she's an autopilot uh, for an hour, then there is uh, a chance, then one out of two times, she continues to be on autopilot the next hour, while one out of three times, she ends up being changing states and being critical of herself the next hour. These are all simplified notions, of course. I'm trying to um, illustrate a point. I'm not trying to say this is realistic. Um, one out of 12 times, she actually goes from uh, autopilot to state one, thinking about something interesting. And another one out, one out of 12 times, she ends up in state two, where she's engaged with something interesting and exciting outside um, externally. She's also comp uh, compiled data for the other states. Like if you're in some other states, then what are the chances of you moving to um, yet another one? And, she, and, and all of this is, is, is put, given to us in a, in a table. So these are how the, the probabilities of transitioning from one state to another. Um, and this is the information that we already talked about. So the column headings tell us the state that uh, uh, Chloe is at some hour. And then the row um, uh, headings that, that, that are telling us where she ends up. So if she's on autopilot at one hour, then the next hour she might, she's thinking about something interesting one twelfth of the time. She's engaged with an external task of interest one twelfth of a time, one third of a time. Uh, she's thinking of, she's being critical of herself and half of the time she's again checking notifications. Um, and she's done this with the other, um, the other um, states as well. And, um, and, and here are the data that we have. Each one of these columns add up to one, because if you're, for example, at some state critical of yourself, then the next hour, you're gonna be doing something. And so those numbers, one six, one twelfth, one, uh, one half and fourth in the third column have to add up to one. Okay, and, 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 and so for example, in this table, table if, if, if Chloe is engaged in one hour, engaged with some external task, task then one of 18 times, uh, one over 18 times, she will be critical of herself in the next hour. Okay, so now, so that's the data we're given. And then the question, what are the questions? What kind of questions could you be asking? And, and the, here's one question. Over the long term, what are the chances that Chloe is in the thinking state in any given hour? So if you're walking down the street and you run into Chloe, what should you bet in terms of her state? Like, so, so in, how often is she going to be thinking about something interesting? Um, so that's one kind of a question. Uh, the next kind of a question is something like this. Does the answer depend on this, which state of mind she starts with? Uh, does it matter what she, on day one, which state she, she is over the long term? In fact, in the long term question, you could also ask even if, it makes, if it's a question that makes sense or not. Maybe um, it depends on the day of the week. Maybe on odd days, she's going to be, because of these numbers, the way they're going to work, this is going to be some kind of a periodic thing. Uh, for a while, she's going to be thinking and engaged. And for a while, she's going to be an autopilot and critical and then going back and forth. And then so maybe the, 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 we should be analyzing it that way in terms of uh, the ebbs and flows as opposed to the long-term probabilities. Or maybe we should be uh, talking about uh, the kind of questions that we ask. But, but in any case, whatever it is that we get, does it depend on the initial state? You may have heard of a butterfly effect. When a butterfly um, uh, moves in China, then that affects the weather in the United States um, sometime later. Um, that's a case where, if true, um, is telling us that um, the state of weather depends very much on the initial states, and, and a little bit of change in that is gonna be chaotic. It's gonna affect 
um, lots of changes later. Is that the case here also or not? Or, or, or things don't really matter where you start, eventually you will be at the same place. So I'm not gonna answer this question. We will answer a question similar to this or this particular question sometime later in the semester. But, um, uh, but, but I, what I want you to think about is what kind of a question is this? Do you have the tools to be able to answer this question or even talk about it? Um, uh, like, like in the sense that what would be the right language to talk about it? Is it calculus, for example? Can you take derivatives? Can you look at integrals? Um, or, or, or statistics or something else. I mean, like, what is it that, how would we talk about this problem? So here's the second problem. In this problem, we have a two-stage factory. This factory is building scooters. And, but then the first stage is not actually building the scooters. It's building things it needs to build scooters. So in stage one, it starts with raw materials in this case, and this is a very simplified um, example. Uh, you presumably need a lot more stuff, but, but, um, uh, but proof of concept, we are gonna start with steel, rubber, plastic, and aluminum. And from that, we're gonna pr produce uh, intermediate goods, the frames of the scooters, um, uh, the handlebars, the wheels, the clamps, and the bearings. And then in stage two, we use those intermediate goods, the frames, bars, wheels, clamps, and bearings, uh, to make three types of scooters um, that have been named uh, Kalimirna, Kadota, and Sierra. Uh, those are varieties of figs, by the way. And, um, and uh, what do we know about this process? We have these things called input-output tables that tell us how much of a unit um, of any one of those inputs you need to produce one unit of, of the output. And then I will give you some of those tables. Well, two tables. Here's one table. The first, this first table that tells us how you go from steel, rubber, plastic, and aluminum, the raw material, to the intermediate goods to the frames, the bars, wheels, clamps, and the bearings. And, and for example, if you look at the second column, it says that to build one handlebar, you need four units of steel, whatever those units are, one unit of rubber, one unit of plastic, and no aluminum. And, and, and different things for different things. The frame uses lots of aluminum because it wants to be um, not, not that heavy. Um, and, and then um, we have a similar table for, go, for building uh, those three types of scooters. And for each of them, we need different kinds of um, things. Like for example, the Sierra scooter has actually five wheels, one in like, like three in front and two in the back. Uh, whereas Kalimirna um, has only two, um, two wheels. Okay, um, so what, what, are, what are the kinds of questions that we might wanna ask in, in this kind of a situation? We have a whole bunch of data and we wanna ask questions. Now, these are actually questions that you could answer. Like if you, just put your mind to it, you could answer. So one question is that quickly find, the quickly part maybe you can't, but you can certainly find a table relating the raw materials to the finished products. You could say, well, okay, the raw materials, steel, the aluminum, the plastic, the rubber, how much of uh, each of those I need to make a Sierra scooter, for example. Um, and the data is all there and you can figure it out. But the question is, is, is there an easy way, like for example, in, in calculus, if I ask you, um, how fast is this object moving? You would just say, well, take the derivative. Is there something similar to that here where we could say, well, do blah, and then, and then you would get that. Um, another kind of a question would be that an actual order comes in for, for 10 of the first type, 21 of the second, and 11 of the third kind of scooters. And then you want to know how much raw materials you need and how, many, how much uh, intermediate goods you should produce. Again, the data is there, and if... Uh, if you had a little bit of patience, you could figure it out. But again, what we are interested in is a language, a mathematical language that allows for asking and answering these questions uh, pretty clearly and quickly. Okay, here's a third kind of a problem. Um, you have drawn some kind of a three-dimensional shape and you want to shape or move the shape somehow. So for example, this might be something you do in computer graphics. So here, for example, I have a, 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 a kind of a shape and I might want to be able, want to, be able to rotate it. Uh, for example, or maybe I want to um, take my shape and stretch it. Um, and so the question is that, how do I do that? And what do I mean by that? What I mean is that the original shape, I maybe had the coordinates of each of the corners and I knew which ones were connected to which. Now, I don't wanna have to go calculate a lot of things. I wanna be able to transform the shape and get new coordinates um, very quickly. How would I do that? I could come up with a lot of other questions like for example how would you um, 
output data you get from sound, from music, or from and so on, and 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 encode that and 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 change that and make it uh, lower or higher and so forth. But but these three problems give you a bit of understanding of the kinds of problems that we're talking about. Now, these problems are examples of discrete problems. They're not about continuous functions, functions that are continuously changing. They're about data that it's discrete. If the last problem, the data is the coordinates of the various points. Uh, in the other ones, there was those tables, the input output tables, or those transition probabilities from going from one state to another. And we have to be able to, among other things, organize the data efficiently, deal with a large number of variables, and be able to transform the data conveniently. So those are some of the things we have to do. Now, the thing that I want you to pay attention to now is that this is very different than calculus. Um, and in fact, it's not clear how you might be able to use any of the uh, tools of calculus um, for, this, um, for this job. In fact, calculus's idea is that you can glean a lot of information, you can get a lot of information about a function, as long as that function is differentiable, um, by looking at it locally, locally means look at a specific point on the function, and approximate that function with a linear function, with a line. Which line? The tangent line. All of calculus puts all of its uh, money on the, on the proposition that for differentiable functions, you can go to a, at a certain point, if you're interested, if you want to zoom into the function at that point and deal with the function at that point, you really can replace the function with the tangent line. The tangent line is a very good approximation for the function locally. From that, you can get lots of information. That's what calculus does. All of calculus is about that, is about uh, doing that. Now, in linear algebra, we instead, we don't really try to deal with very complicated functions. What we do instead is we study high dimensional spaces and we study linear functions on them. But the linear functions are the, what the corresponding thing to lines in high dimensional spaces. So instead of, in, in calculus, mo most of the functions you looked at were things like y equals sine of x or or y equals e to the x, or x squared, or something like that. And those functions are functions of one variable. The variable, there's just one that lives on a line, on a one-dimensional space. But what we are interested in is, is high-dimensional, 47-dimensional spaces, and um, lines or linear functions on those, uh, on those spaces. And why do, are we interested in that? Because when then in vector calculus, or multivariable calculus, you can use this information that linear algebra gives you about high dimensional spaces and lines, and then you do what calculus does, which is you try to take complicated functions in, multi, uh, with ma in many dimensions, and you re approximate them with linear functions. That's not the part that we're gonna do in this class. We're gonna, we do, you do that in a vector calculus class. What we do here is study the high dimensional space space and linear functions on them. So the, we study the, the space for multivariable calculus, and the context and the lines. And in fact, for example, those transformations we saw, the rotations um, or, or stretching, those are all um, examples of what lines do. Right? Even in, in one dimensionals, y equals 5x is, is multiplying everything by five, is expanding everything, but that's just in one direction. But if you're in, in multiple directions, then the corresponding things to the lines does that. So these um, linear functions, have a lot of use other than what you do with them in multivariable calculus, but that's the object of our study. Now, the, the other thing that I want to do now is to tell you why we want to study linear algebra and, and, and the, how we're going to do that in these lectures. For, first of all, linear algebra is actually quite fun, but besides that, it's very important. Since it's a new language and it's used in many parts of mathematics, almost no part of mathematics is untouched by linear algebra, and it's used in the sciences, in, in chemistry and physics, uh, for example, quite a bit, um, as well as in the social sciences. You won't be able to do serious economics without knowing some linear algebra. Um, and, and not just economics, in, 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 in the quantitative uh, parts of other, other social sciences, you will also use linear algebra, or at least you wanna know linear algebra to be able to point out that that use of mathematics in that area was bogus. Um, so, um, and it's a new language, and, and, um, uh, and, uh, and, and what I mean by that is that, like, for example, if you think about 
when you start, before you started learning calculus, well, you had a worldview, you knew about things, you knew about some things and you didn't know about other things. But by the time you've done with studying calculus, you have a whole new vocabulary and a whole new language to talk about phenomena that are happening. You can talk about rate of change, you can talk about integrals, you can talk about uh, many different things that um, you, you can put those things in, in a new way of talking about that, um, that you couldn't have done before. If someone says, how do you find the maximum profit or maximum this or that? You just say, well, do you have the function? If so, take the derivative, put it equal to zero. That's, that's something that you wouldn't be able to do if you didn't have the vocabulary and, and so on of, of, um, of calculus. Linear algebra is similar. It has its own uh, way of thinking about things and talking about things that, 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 that when you learn, you'll just have this richer way of uh, discussing things. Um, and the other thing for us, uh, at, uh, for us and for these set of lectures, the, the other text, subtext that we uh, will focus on is uh, abstractions and proofs. Now we could just focus on the linear algebra part and say, well, here's how you do certain things. But we are going to, in this class, um, in this set of lectures, also talk about abstract concepts, ideas, and proofs. And, and, and this will get to the heart of what mathematics is about as opposed to how it's used. And, and I will discuss that in a little bit further. Now, but before I talk about proofs and abstractions, um, I just wanna say that because it's a language, it means that it will come up with a bunch of new vocabulary that you have to um, get used to. And then just like any other language, you have to learn how to uh, practice that. You have to practice um, reading, um, you have to practice writing, and, and speaking it. And, and the syntax matters, the words matter, but the syntax also matters. And, and we, will, we will do that. You're not supposed to know how to do this. That's what this set of lectures will get you to do. Now, I said abstractions and proofs, so let's, let's, let's uh, uh, open that up a little bit and, and, and think about what that means. What do I mean by abstract? By abstract, I don't mean like complicated. I don't mean uh, nonsensical. I don't mean um, something um, that, that is not sort of concrete. Well, I mean, in some ways I do mean not concrete, but, but I don't mean something that you can't understand. It's abstract in that way. That's not what I mean. I mean abstract in the same way that the number 47 is an abstract object. 47 is an abstract object. Why? Well, because if you're walking down the street, you're never going to run into 47. It's not going to be, oh, this is 47. There's nothing out there in the world that's 47. But there are 47 trees, there are 47 cars, there could be 47 cows. Um, there, there are many 47 things. But 47 itself is an abstract object. Someone looked at um, these different examples and decided that there, there's, a, there's some good, good to kind of come out of taking this concept of 47 and making it up um, and saying that the thing that these 47 cows and uh, 47 trees and 47 cars have in common is their number, and, and we're going to call that 47. Um, and, and why do we do that? I mean, why, did they, why would that be useful? Well, you, you can answer that yourself. Um, first of all, you can do many things at once. If you want to know what 47 cars together with three cars are, and another day you want to know 47 trees plus three trees or 47 cows plus three cows, instead of doing those separately, um, and gain, getting distracted by things of the like, like, okay, are the trees big or small or, or the cows, how, how heavy they are, um, you can concentrate and just look at the, uh, deal with the abstract things. 47 plus three is 50. And then that thing um, will apply to the cows, the trees and the cars and many other situations that maybe you hadn't thought about. It allows you to do lots of things at once. It, it's efficient in that way. Um, and, uh, but more important than that, it gets to the heart of the matter. Well, if you do the right abstraction given your problem, the problem you want to solve, if you abstract it well, then what you're doing is you're getting rid of extra information, the information that you don't need. And, and because of that, you can focus on the right stuff, the stuff that you need to solve your problem. If all you need to know is how many cows there are, then you really just want to know 47 plus three. You don't really care anything else about the cow. Um, and the same thing with um, if you want to know if you have 47 trees and, and trees and then other three trees, how many trees that is. Now, this is something that's very different in mathematics than many other fields. If you, for example, uh, want to study um, uh, something about uh, contemporary American society, um, and, and for example, uh, uh, then 
it doesn't make sense to focus on just one little thing and then forget everything else. Um, if, if, you're, if you're interested in, in studying uh, police brutality, if you just worry about chokeholds and nothing else, then you're gonna miss the big picture. In many parts of uh, the academy, the thing to do is not to abstract out and, and just look from, um, uh, for, from this abstract point of view, but, and, and focus on one little thing, but rather to take a holistic approach, try to bring in all kinds of different things, be interdisciplinary, bring all kinds of information and try to look at something from many points of view. That's not what usually mathematics does. Mathematics in this um, uh, way of looking at things is actually does the opposite, which would be the wrong thing to do in many other disciplines. Um, it, what it does is that it, it picks one aspect of um, of, of an object, abstracts that out, and studies that very rigorously and um, uh, to see what we get. And the amazing thing is that that approach has some uses. I mean, it's, 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 it's a, um, I mean, you should reserve judgment on whether or not um, that, is a, um, that is something that's worth doing. And, and you should, like for example, this class is a good, good example of that. You should just see, uh, take your time and, and, and throughout the course, you should be, keep asking, is it worth the fact that we are abstracting things out? Are we getting anything more out of it? Now, how to abstract, I, I think I already told you, you look at many examples and glean what they have in common. You don't just sort of say, oh, I wanna study blah. You, you look at many, many different examples and see that, yeah, like, look, all of these examples have blah in common. And because of that, it may make sense to focus on that one thing and, and, and try to study. At the end of the day, the proof of the pudding is in the eating. It, it makes sense to abstract that thing out if you're doing so gave you some mileage and you learned something out of it. There's no way to tell a priori before doing it that it is gonna be useful or not. And that's what we're gonna do in this uh, set of lectures. We're not just gonna start by telling you some abstract object and starting studying it. We first, the first thing we will do is look at a number of different mathematical situations, mathematical worlds, mathematical settings, and see that even though on the face of it in a, in a, in a superficial way, they are very different, maybe actually not superficial ways. In some profound ways, they might be very different. Um, in, there is something about them that, that's common. There's some thread that goes through all of these different mathematical situations. We take that out. In our case, that's gonna be something called vector spaces. And, and we then uh, try to uh, study that. Um, okay, now, so that's about abstractions. But what about proofs? First of all, by proofs, I don't mean some formal way of doing proofs as you might have done in, um, in high school or middle school geometry, where you had to do like a two column proof and you had to say certain words in certain ways in certain order. By proof, I mean a, uh, a sort of airtight um, argument, it, like an argument that tells you why whatever it is that you're asserting makes sense given the assumptions that we had. And in, in that sense, proof is a very transferable skill. This is something that you really want to be able to do. It's, it's, it's figuring out what the consequences of your assumptions are. But why do we do proofs? Well, first of all, we do proofs because we want to know things that we do are correct. And in the case that we are doing things in this course, since we're dealing with abstract objects that you don't really know about yet, um, then um, you, will, you might have some intuition or some guesses in terms of what might be true about them. But, um, but we have to actually do proofs to make sure that, they, that those intuitions match our definition and we're not misled. And again, the things that we're gonna study are these objects that we abstracted from many different examples, but those examples aren't all the examples, they're just some of the examples that we saw. And our concepts will apply to many examples, hitherto though, um, unknown to us. And therefore we have got to make sure that they work. Sort of like uh, when, someone is, when, when, um, uh, uh, when someone is writing the constitution for, for a country, like the founding, um, fund, founding fathers of the United States did, you can't just look at what's happening right now and what you want to use. You, have, you want to think ahead and say, okay, I want to, uh, I, I've got to make sure that my system works even for um, situations that I've not foreseen as long as it applies. So in our case, that means that our definitions might apply to situations we're not uh, sure of, we're not, we haven't seen yet, and therefore our assertions have to work for those as well. But as important as this is, 
um, if this was all it was, then uh, there would be a reason to say that uh, maybe it doesn't really matter as much because you could trust me. I mean, I'm, I'm getting uh, paid a pretty good salary at, uh, at Pomona College. I should know what I'm talking about. And you could just say that, okay, just tell us what's true. We'll believe you. Um, I mean, you know, and, 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 you know, and if you don't believe me, maybe you could, you could ask, you know, 10 different experts. And if they all agreed or most of them agreed, then you would say, well, then, then it got to be right. I don't have to know why it works. Um, someone else does already know. So the, the other reason for using, doing proofs is actually the much more important one is that proofs help you understand. It's only when you prove things that you really understand what you're talking about. So we are going to define things and you might think that you know what the things we defined mean, but but there will be subtle parts about those definitions that you will not have thought about. You will think about those when you're trying to go to a proof. You're trying to make an argument using those definitions. That's exactly when you figure out what those things mean. And so doing proofs helps you understand. And, um, and uh, it, it helps you understand how the different concepts come together, like how there are different things related to each other. It, at the end of the day, it's like looking under the hood. You don't want to just take linear algebra as a car and drive it, but rather, it's not just a tool, we want to be able to appreciate the craftsmanship, how it's put together. And the reason, and, and if you know that, if you know how a car is built and you know how I have to build a car, that's definitely a different kind of a skill than just being able to drive it. And so, um, so that's what we're aiming. We're aiming for you to be able to uh, fix the car when it's broken, when, 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 the, the, when the results that we are uh, working with are not applying and you can't use them and you need new tools, we want to be able to be at a position to, to be able to come up with those. And so that's why proofs are important. It's important to understand how the concepts fit together, what the subtle aspects are, and that's why we do proofs. And that's why you are going to do proofs, even though you're not supposed to have any experience with proofs before this, class, before this set of lectures. Um, I expect you to um, grapple with proofs through this set of lectures. And finally, we will also do some applications. In fact, linear algebra is full of applications. And the examples I gave you at the beginning um, was sort of maybe gave you the impression that it's going to be all applications. Not so. Um, here, where I'm, I am focused on, some linear algebra classes are not. They're more, mostly app, uh, focused on applications but I'm mostly focused on how the ideas fit together. I feel like if you know that, then the applications will happen automatically. Um, and, 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 and almost any other math class you take will be an application of, of linear algebra as well as physics classes, chemistry, if you take PCHEM, or if you take um, um, uh, any um, macroeconomics or, 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 or um, many other uh, classes, you will see plenty of applications as we will see some, including the problems that I post at the beginning of the hour. That this is the end of this first lecture. Um, I will see you in the next lectures. Always at the end, I'm going to put a picture just because sometimes the videos get cut up and, and I, want, no, I don't want that to happen. And so just to stop that from happening, I will have a picture at the end. See you next time.